almost every design profession or artistic endeavor I can think of has as a hidden aspiration, uh, a, a, a hope, is that people who study and become scholars in those areas will become connoisseurs. They'll have refined tastes. They'll really understand things at a depth and at a level that uh, common folk, just plain folks, can't. Um, certainly, that holds true in, um, in educational technology. We don't talk about it much. In the profession, you won't hear about it a whole lot. Um, but a landmark book was written several years ago by Dennis Flinko from the University of Manitoba and John Belland from the Ohio State University. And it was called Paradigms Regained. Uh, play on words. It's not Paradise Lost, Paradigms Regained. But they were really looking at uh, semiotic theory and uh, postmodern thought and how that informs becoming a connoisseur or connoisseurs in educational technology. Um, and I was really surprised to see that book come out because I'd, I had never really heard people talking about that stuff before. It's a long time ago. And uh, uh, I think that they made a really strong contribution. Again, not, so, not necessarily so much in the particulars of it, but in the idea that that's an aspiration we should reach for. And I think that's true. So let's look at a few aspects of it. I draw on their work. I'll uh, throw in a few little gems of my own. But, uh, the, but the idea here is that we want to examine ways in which the educational technologist might become a connoisseur, what that involves. Well, for one thing, think about it. In music and in literature and in art, um, there is a canon of great works. Many people can, can give you a list of some of the great pieces of literature of all time. You know, the must-read lists that you see online and things like that. I, Everybody's got to read Moby Dick and Crime and Punishment. And if you haven't read Huckleberry Finn, you really don't understand a lot of things. Uh, Robinson Crusoe. You, you know, that, that list as it, as it goes through. Um, uh, uh, the things that people who really understand the field and uh, the range of things that are available say, these are the gems, these are the beauties, these are the things you really should attend to if you want to be a scholar in the area. Well, do we have a canon of great works in educational technology? I'm not sure we do. I'm not sure we've ever identified them anyway. Are those, this would be a really interesting exercise for you to go through is try to put together a list of what you consider great examples of educational technology. Those things that people anywhere could um, could you'd have a strong degree of consensus around how good they are and how important they were to the field of educational technology. I don't think we've thought about that. I don't think we've thought about putting those things together, but I think it'd be an interesting exercise. All um, connoisseurs and connoisseurship has a critical element to it. It means that we critique things. And we know what that means with an art critic. We've seen them do it. We've seen movie critics. They come on and tell us what's good and bad about the next series that's coming out or the next, uh, the next installment in, in, uh, um, in, in a movie that, that we might be interested in seeing. They'll talk in depth about characters and, and setting and flow and, and uh, uh, the, the directorial decisions and, and the production elements. They, they go through all of those kinds of things and they tell us their opinion about why that particular film works or doesn't work. An art critic is very good at picking apart details and providing historical background for uh, what you're looking at in a particular piece of art. Art critics uh, and music critics and film critics, they have depth, right? They have experience, and they bring that to uh, uh, their own observations about what it is they're, they're reviewing. I think there's an opportunity to do that in educational technology. 
But one thing that is vitally important to remember about criticism, it's not always negative. It's not about being negative. I just read a book review on the third major novel coming out from uh, um, a, a writer I like a lot. I'm not going to mention the name. I just in a pitch. But a writer I like a lot. It's his third major novel. First novel was made into a, a movie. And this reviewer, it was a very erudite review. Uh, used big words. In fact, uh, used words that George Orwell would have said uh, created sentences out of cindercrete block. They were so dense. But in the entire review, he didn't have one good thing to say about this writer's third novel. And this is after I'd read that novel, and I thought it was a major important piece of literature, a piece of work that is going to stand the test of time and will be taught in universities in decades to come. I think it was stronger than any, either of his first two major novels that came out. This critic had nothing good to say. I would say that's failed criticism. And I think that it's important that we, if you're going to exercise, exercise refined perception, train your perception so that you can make deep um, and refined uh, observations about something, it should include both the good and the bad from your perspective with reasons why. You should be able to back up what you're saying. Uh, now, this critic did back up what he was saying, but he just had nothing nice kind to say. I was blown away by it. And it, it reminded me... Um, I read it just yesterday, and it reminded me the importance of bringing up that element of criticism. Doesn't mean you've got to be a jerk, you know. Um, anyhow, I think he was a jerk. <laughs> okay, uh, a connoisseur needs in in order to be a connoisseur, you have to develop fine discrimination skills. Um, you have to see those refined things. You have to see the things the common viewer wouldn't see. So if you're looking at educational technology products, somebody builds a great website or somebody builds an important piece of instruction, you should be able to pick it apart in a way where you say, look, I see the structure of this thing. I see these fine... The, the, here's, a, here's an important um, decision the instructional designer made right here. Take a look at that should be able to do that. Fine discrimination, not just the big stuff. Um, you should have a hierarchical system of concepts, right? You should understand that these things harken back and forth between uh, philosophy and theory, which be informs theory that informs perhaps pedagogy, that, that informs design elements that are employed to achieve the technology or the, the pedagogical decisions that were made that are theoretically consistent with a particular philosophical orientation. So you can go up and down the ladder of systems of concepts. So if you said that this was a this was uh, to be a constructivist uh, uh, treatment of some, or let's just say that you have an idealist perspective that this person was taking, and so there was a, a constructivist approach that was employed, and then, so they used uh, several kinds of pedagogical approaches that, that empowered the learner to make the decisions and drive the instruction, and here are some of the decisions and tools that were employed in the navigation of the design that achieved that, okay? you would take a look at where it worked and where it didn't work along an, hierarch an hierarchical system of concepts. You, would, um, you have to develop organizing principles to structure relationships among concepts. You have, to, you have to know that these principles inform that stuff. So if you're, if you're looking at uh, something from a constructivist perspective or from a cognitivist perspective, that there are principles that obtain that fit together in structures and you would see them exercised in whatever it is you're criticizing. You would also develop strategies to focus on salient aspects of complex instructional phenomena. Nobody's really interested in looking at and criticizing simple stuff. 
I mean, it should be a complex phenomenon if you're uh, uh, if you're wanting to spend your time doing a serious critique of it. If you want to learn from it, often the crit uh, by the way the critic in conducting criticism uses that also as a method of learning about something. You can employ uh, criticism as a tool set for helping yourself learn about something you're examining. So you would have strategies to focus on, focus on what's salient and what's trivial in something. What do you ignore and what do you pay attention to? What's interesting? What isn't interesting? You also uh, would employ perceptual discrimination, and that can happen at a lot of different levels, uh, but you're looking for fine and subtle differences when you're exercising connoisseurship. You know, uh, you're, sometimes there are things that actually approach the physical limits of the sensory organs and nerves. You might pick up on, um, on music or sound effects that are employed in a treatment that are so subtle that they would be missed unless you called attention to them, that they would be so perhaps faint or uh, tied historically to something important. Perhaps there's a, uh, a soundtrack that ties back musically to an earlier era that makes a statement about what you're looking at now, how, where it situates that piece historically. And that's only done with the soundtrack. Maybe it's never mentioned in the narration. So, these are fine and subtle differences that you look for, that you pay attention to, and you try and draw attention to in your criticism. Um, it could be anything from text and font discriminations to use of key light and how lighting is used in video production to recognizing patterns of feedback in instruction to the tone of instructional materials. I mean, how, what's the feel of something when it's presented to people? I mean, Think about, it, is, is the tone playful? Is it humorous? Is it serious? Is it, is it supposed to be driving home a point? Is it repetitious because uh, of the urgency of, of, of employing factual information that the, that the viewer has to own in order to even move further in, in something? All of these are fine perceptual discriminations one can make. Bellin put it beautifully. Now, this is Belland of the book. Um, he said in one place that the educational technology connoisseur will need to spend many hours, whether required by coursework or not, reading and viewing and observing, participating, and otherwise accumulating a vast range of perceptual experience with instructional products and systems. I think this is a place where we fall down repeatedly as a discipline, as a profession. I think as instructional designers, we often go about redesigning the same thing that's been similar things that have been designed before and before and before, but never take advantage of that previous learning and never expose ourselves to enough of it to see, oh, wait a second, I'm going to draw on, it's called precedent. I'm going to draw on precedent. I'm going to draw on what somebody did before and call that forward and use that in my own design. That's not cheating. <laughs> That's drawing on precedent. That's a respect for what people have done before. And if it's a direct employment of something that they, you did before, obviously you reference it, you cite it, you attribute it to the person. But the whole thing about how people might have used color or how they might have employed a very uh, powerful rhythm in, in a presentation. Those are things you don't need to cite, but the, there are some things, that you, some things you can draw on, learn from, and then employ in your own designs. And I think that it's terribly important that we expose ourselves to more and more work done by others. If we aren't doing that regularly, and if we aren't doing it carefully and critically, we're not growing as a profession. We're growing as individuals, maybe, but we're not growing as a, as a profession where we're carrying forward the knowledge of the past into the future and building on that. I worked with a group of people for a while called the uh, Instructional Design and Technology uh, Futures Group, and uh, a bunch of people we were 
you know, a self-designed think tank. And we were, we were, we were trying to come up with important things that should be considered in instructional design and technology. And, and in this case, uh, one of the things that came up, I thought was incredibly important. They said, you know what we need? We need a repository of failure. <laughs> we need to have a repository of products that didn't work so that we can look at them and not keep making those same dumb mistakes because we've all done it we've all done it we've we've all designed something that didn't work very well and then we discover somebody else earlier had made the same mistake and so exposing ourselves to the things that failed not just the things that are successful could be very important i actually think we need a repository of both the repository of successes and failures and those nice mixtures of things that worked in some ways and didn't work in others um, we're, there are some developing concepts important in uh, uh, connoisseurship, or we have to develop concepts and to, to conduct connoisseurship, to conduct ourselves as connoisseurs. Simple concepts aren't central to connoisseurship. They're the more complex things. They're the nuance-rich concept learning. And that's critical. Concepts with indeterminate limits and hierarchies. We don't know where they begin and end, where their influence starts and stops. Okay? We want uh, some examples. Humor. Just think of all the ways you've seen humor attempted <laughs> in educational technology. I mean, if, if my chair fell over right now, half of you would laugh. Okay? Um, the other half of you, <laughs> you'd probably laugh. Um, but the, the, the whole idea is that it's humor is unpredictable. It's difficult. You can't, it's, it's a nuance, rich concept, something that might work in some contexts and not others. And to be able to critique where and when and, and do a serious critique of humor, imagine that, uh, is an important, uh, um, example, I think of a nuance rich concept in educational technology. There's also cultural sensitivity. Where in educational technology are we being appropriately culturally sensitive? Where are we not? Where are we employing stereotypes in unfortunate ways? Where are we where are we co-opting uh, other cultures and employing in trivial ways very deep concepts from that culture? That's not respectful, right? And we could uh, do a critique, do a connoisseur will understand some of the subtleties around cultural sensitivity and where and when things can happen. We have uh, compressed video treatments, different kinds of streaming treatments, different kinds of video that are used. I'm interested in that kind of stuff. Uh, ease of navigation and audit trails and how people move through things and how we attach meaning then to how people move through very complex instructional environments or educational environments and cadence and rhythm. Uh, when are we moving from fast to slow to repetitive to pausing and thinking through things for a bit? When we think about how those are employed in educational technology, they are all the time. But they're things that we don't often talk about. They aren't part of the, the list of drawing from, from uh, cognitive learning theory, uh, a list of 14 gestalt principles you might employ here. I mean, they, uh, and and ways to do that. It's it's not a matter of selective focus or or of sequencing in a particular way. Much more concept rich than that, or nuance rich than that, and uh, much more difficult to tie down. So much more um, available for criticism and deep thought. Okay, there are concept hierarchies and we can go into all kinds of stuff but we'll just you know the philosophical emphasis you might look at uh, whether things are objectivist constructivist postmodern uh, the technology itself whether it's collaborative or guided in in a guided independent learning whether it's employing multimedia effectively or individually video sound and graphics and how those things are employed uh, we might look at instructional design strategies 
Okay, we might look at sequencing and control and pacing and feedback and how those things are fit together. We might also look at design components. We could look at the layout and the heuristics and, and the gestalt principles as they do uh, uh, play out in a particular piece of instruction. All of these things are conceptual hierarchies that could be employed in deep criticism. Okay, and so when we look at things like media literacy, and when we reconsider things like semiotic theory, you can see how they can both be informed by and can promote the development of a connoisseurial approach to educational technology. Something that I think would benefit our profession, and beyond that would just be a heck of a lot of fun to be better and better and better uh, at understanding what we look at and why it works and where it works and why it doesn't and where it doesn't.